Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Candace Bousquet, and today I'll be talking about web caching and service workers. So, what is a web cache? Um, a cache comes from the French word uh, cachier, which means to hide. So, to that effect, caches are a little bit mysterious, right? So, when we go to a particular web page, we've all seen a cache in effect where um, the second time we access a web page, it's faster than the first time. So, what is going on there? Um, a cache, in terms of just computer memory, um, is a small dedicated space for storing information that can be accessed quickly. So that can be on your CPU, or your disk, or your browser cache. And we'll be talking about browser caches. Um, so, why do we need caches? Um, well, the basic premise is that the internet is really slow. Um, and some people in the industry sort of joke that the best requests are those that do not need to communicate with the server. So, i.e., things that don't even rely on the internet whatsoever. Um, and then this is a, a graph um, that Walmart produced showing that how um, the conversion rate on your website is inversely proportional to the latency. And actually, between one to four seconds, you lose um, so much of your audience. So people really don't want to stick around for a site that takes any more than like four seconds to load. Um, so um, let's dig a little bit deeper and see what's going on with browser caches. Um, this is, these are screenshots from uh, the develop developer tools. Um, and you can see there's certain things going on here. Um, as I was sort of poking around, didn't really know um, what the difference was between these 304 statuses that we're getting, which means content not mod modified, versus um, 200 requests that were, or responses that were sent from the cache. And just so you guys know, every browser is a little bit different. Um, so these things will change based on um, sort of like the functionality of the reload button or um, ways that certain things are stored in memory. So uh, disregarding those types of variables, uh, what can we do about caching? Um, so there are certain things that we can take advantage of. Um, and those things are within the response headers. Um, so there's this uh, property called cache control. Um, and there you can assign it certain uh, attributes such as no store, which means every single time a user requests an asset, um, you're always going to ask the server for that particular asset. Um, you're not going to store it in your cache. So this is for stuff that's like constantly updating. Um, no cache is a little bit different. Um, so that's, again, you're going to ask the server for that resource, but if there haven't been any changes since the last time you cached it, then the server will tell you to just use what, whatever is in the cache. So those are your 304 messages. Um, and then must revalidate is a tiny bit different. It just, it's only going to go to the server once it finds something in the cache has expired. Um, so that's sort of the standard way that a cache works. Um, it's just a more explicit way of stating it. Um, public versus private. Um, private is really only necessary if you're dealing with very sensitive information, um, like a banking information, and you only want it stored on the, um, the end client's computer, not any intermediary computers. Um, and then max age uh, has to do with the expiration date, so how long in seconds does it take before that resource expires. Um, and e-tags are sort of the mechanism behind comparing whether what you have in your cache is the freshest resource available. So in your request, um, you'll send along this identifier. Um, it's just a string, and then that will be compared to the string that's generated on the back end. And there are certain libraries for doing this. Um, and sometimes you can create an e-tag from like hashing the contents in the file. Um, right, so these are just some suggestions about how to use the cache effectively. Um, for HTML, it's a good idea that you're always checking with the server to see if there's something um, more recent available, because uh, you never want your client to be looking at something that's stale. So you should be using the no cache header, um, or determining what the max age of your, um, of your document is. So that could be a few minutes, it could be hours, it could be days. Um, for everything else, usually CSS and JavaScript doesn't change a whole lot. Um, and one common thing that you'll see is you'll 
um, have sort of like a string, which is a fingerprint that identifies each of these uh, JavaScript or CSS files so that the browser knows um, it's looking for that one particular version. Um, and if you ever make changes to your CSS or your JavaScript, then you're going to change uh, the string, that fingerprint. Um, and lastly, try to minimize the amount of churn in your application. So if you have something that changes frequently, maybe like extract that out and create a new file. Um, and that, that can be cached freq um, yeah, frequently versus something else that um, needs to be saved for a long time. OK, so service workers is a, a new sort of technology. It's a JavaScript web worker. Um, and it runs in the background of an application. And you probably have a lot of service workers that you're not even aware of right now. Um, so service workers act as sort of like a, a proxy server. So when you have any inbound requests from your client, your service worker will intercept those. Um, and it'll see if it has any of those assets in the cache. If it does, it'll send them back. Um, if not, it'll pass along that request to your back end. Um, so it's really good for, um, like, if you're designing around, like, an offline experience or, like, when a client doesn't have a good connection, and I'll demo this in just a minute, um, there are some prerequisites that you need. You have to have a secure connection or be on local host. Um, you have to be using one of those browsers there. Um, and also, when you register a service worker, it needs to be in your root directory so it has access to all the underlying files in your application. Um, so here's just like a snippet, a snippet of code where you can see that we're first determining whether we have the service worker available uh, in the browser, and then we register the service worker. So the service worker will live in your browser uh, until it's unregistered. Um, so this is why you can sort of have these hidden service workers and not even know about it, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and then you pick which URLs you want to cache. So let's say anything that's like crucial to have when a user accesses your home page, let's say. Um, and when that, the service worker installs itself, it will cache all those URLs. Um, and then lastly, this is the event listener that on a fetch request, it will check to see if it has that resource in the cache and respond with that. So um, this is a very simple application uh, from one of our workshops called Juke. And um, you can see here, so I can click into these albums and see a list of songs. But what if I turn off the internet now? And if I reload, everything comes up fine. Um, and the instance where actually like I'm clicking into these artists, you can see a bunch of errors in the console. And that's because I didn't cache the URLs that have to deal with a particular artist. So you will see errors in the console if you try doing that and you're in offline mode. Um, and additionally, you can go into um, your browser into in Chrome it's service worker internals, and you can kind of see everything that's been registered to your browser here. So you can see like Lodash has a service worker, uh, Google Plus. Um, and so like, for instance, if I take one of these URLs, this one is a React cheat sheet. And remember that we're offline right now it'll still show up. So hopefully you guys can have some fun playing around with this um, and use some of those caching methods uh, to your advantage. Thank you. <laughs>